a person will not follow you and go all in with your vision as a leader if you are answering their primal question with a no or a maybe, okay? They, you know, if I don't feel safe in your organization, I don't feel like you have my back. I don't feel like, I feel like I could get fired at any moment. It's going to be hard to go all in with you. Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast, and I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you enjoy it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel so you never miss a thing. Look, pastors, I know how challenging it can be to keep your sermons fresh and relevant, especially when you preach week after week. So to help, I've created for you a 10-step preaching cheat sheet. After decades of preaching, I've simplified a sermon preparation method I use into a series of steps that help me ensure my sermons are engaging, relevant, and memorable before I deliver them. It's super easy to use, just 10 prompts, and you can start using it as quickly as today. Visit preachingcheatsheet.com or click the link in the description to get a free copy sent to you today. This episode is also presented by Generis. Now, Generis knows that while many churches take a one-size-fits-all approach to giving, there are several stages of giving that most givers go through, and it's essential for you to recognize each giver's unique phase. For example, the approach to a mature giver differs widely from that of somebody who's new to giving to the church. And so what you need to do is you gotta tailor the engagement to the distinct stages of givers, enabling the church to embark on a journey with each individual. The generosity strategist team at Generis understands the needs of each of these givers well, and they've developed free tools and resources to help you identify them in your church. To take advantage of these free tools or to schedule an introductory coaching call, visit generis.com slash carry. That's G-E-N-E-R-I-S dot com slash carry. And now to today's episode. Mike, it has been uh, way too long. Welcome to your first appearance on the podcast. I know, Carrie. This is like a big moment for me to oh. uh, to be doing this with you. I, I I so respect what you're doing. Obviously, our our friendship and just so I was I was really looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for letting me be here. Well, we met in Atlanta, and I'm kind of like, yeah, that's right. I haven't had Mike on the podcast, and we've met many times before. But I'm like, it's just one of those kind of things where I'm like gosh, it's about time. So I'm really, really thrilled to have you and really benefit a lot from what you do too, Mike. So I'd love for you to give our leaders listening some background. You've done a lot of different things with your life. I get a lot of career questions. It's like, you know, the average person used to be, you know, 40 years with one company and now you have seven careers over the course of your life. I've had multiple <laughs> right. careers. Uh, you've been a bit entrepreneurial with your life too. So fill us in. Very much so. Yeah, I, I kind of see myself as um, addicted to entrepreneurialism and uh -huh. starting things and just trying to make the world a better place. And it's it's taken all different formats over the years. I, I mean, uh, most of the time I have been kind of bivocational. I've been doing sort of for-profit work, but then also doing ministry work. And that's sort of been the theme of my life the past 20 years where, um, you know, I had a, a design firm where I started that uh, in the early 2000s, incredibly successful uh, national firm, you know, 60 plus employees, just crushing it, award winning, did that for 10 years and then realized I, I, I hit my lid on that and wanted to do something new. And so, uh, you know, did uh, work where I wrote um, small group curriculum to help people deal with their struggles and challenges. I have a started an organization called People of the Second Chance, which was all around uh, this idea of what do we do with our our setbacks and how do we make um, these really powerful comebacks. And so, you know, the 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 resume is a bit eclectic, Carrie. But the beautiful thing about this is it really has been about helping people transform their lives mm. and, you know, building roadmaps for, for individuals. Is, and again, that's really, I think, the core of my work today as an executive coach, an author, a speaker, doing workshops. It's help, is helping people be clear about what they want, about their gifts, 
about um, how their their past and trauma may inform their present, and really, I, I think helping people feel empowered in their lives to go after the things that they they want. So that's a part of your story that I wasn't one hundred percent sure of. Is that first decade with a design firm, which is really interesting because I knew you from people a second chance and yeah. and and moving forward. Uh, talk about that. What got? What kind of design did you do? And then how? Because we do have multiple career people listening. How do you go from like designing whatever you're designing to helping people now understand their primal question and get through life certs <laughs> yeah. and all that stuff and all the the really cool stuff you're doing now? That's that's interesting. What about the design part of your life? It, it's really like for me, it's all connected. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that I just so um, the type of design I was at a company I started with a, a friend of mine called Plain Joe Studios that has now uh, it's now called Storyland Studios. And we did uh, environmental design projects, branding, interactive media. It was a very successful, big company. But we started it with just me and my business partner in a bedroom with wires going across the the uh, floor and, you know, two computers trying to figure out what the heck we were doing. And it sort of, it, it just exploded. And I found after about 10 years of doing that, it wasn't at the heart of what I really desired to do because when I was working with clients on these, you know, multi-million dollar projects, I wasn't, I probably wasn't talking about the creative enough. I was talking more about how's your family? How's your marriage? How are you? And so I was literally doing the work that I do today back, you know, 20 years ago in the design firm. And I think you probably have experienced this too, where, you're doing things, but all, hopefully all of those things are, are a narrowing exercise to the core thing that you were created to do. And so for me, I think what I was created to do, even while I was at the design firm, was to uh, help people in their personal growth, help them thrive and flourish. Yes, I was doing creative work and working on creative projects, but fundamentally... It was about them as a person. Mm. Did you know that before you started or was that kind of a revelation as you went along? Yeah, I think I did, did not know it. I thought I, I used to have a license plate that said idea boy on it. <laughs> and I thought my whole, my whole brand, my whole purpose for life was to come up with creative ideas. And I was pretty good at that. I, I, I was, I was a creative and I still am a creative, but it wasn't the core of what uh, I believe I was meant to do with my life. And so I think we all owe it to ourselves to have those check-ins along the journey where we're going like, is this, am I, am I aligned with who I am and my priorities and my values and, and my calling, or am I a little, not, not totally misaligned, but not fully in sync with the very thing that I believe I'm meant to do. And the thing that I do really well, like I'm creative, but I'm better at unpacking things with people. So I love helping my friends through discernment. Just helped a buddy I talked to the other day make another big career change. And he's made a few, which I'm so excited uh-huh. about. But I, in my DMs and in my emails, I get it all the time from people who are trying to figure out what should I do next. And I'm, I'm not, I always say I'm not a very good advisor, like find some people who are close to you because I don't know you. Um, but it's a very common question. So what were the signs? Because you were very successful. It's not like, okay, you know, I got this design firm. Looks like we'll be bankrupt in 18 months. I better jump now. And fight. Like you're, you're right. riding the rocket to the top. Yes. What were some of the signs inside you that made you go, eh, I'm, I'm going to check out. This wasn't for me. Yeah, that's a great question, Carrie. I think um, it's so easy to get caught up in the momentum of the organization or the success of the organization. And I looked around at my life and I said, okay, I've got a nice office, nice paycheck, all the freedom that I could ever want, you know, because that's what happens when you start the company. Yeah. <laughs> you kind of have a lot, you have a lot of freedom to to make different choices. Uh, and yet I think the thing that I paid attention to and that leaders have to pay attention to is the discontent. 
And if we're not honest with the discontent and we're not honest with kind of our passion and the energy that we bring to the work, I remember sitting in a meeting talking about a really important project and I just, I just couldn't care enough about it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a good sign for us to um, go on a little bit of a journey to say, hey, am I in the right place? I'm not saying that there aren't days where we're going to be discouraged or not feel like we're we're into it, but if there's kind of a, a season or just kind of this ongoing nagging within us saying, hey, um, I may not be in the right place, even though everything around me looks like I'm in the right place. Yeah. And that's a great question because I find those moments really hard. I felt that probably about year 17, 18 of pastoring and I pastored for 20 years mm-hmm. and then made the shift to what I'm doing now. And, yes. you know, I don't know whether you found this, but it could be like, is it what I had for breakfast? Is it three counseling sessions that I just need to go to and learn to be Mr. Content? Because things were going really well at the church. And like, how do you know, like on the other side that it's like, well, that was the stupidest thing I ever did with my life. Like walking away from ministry or walking away from the successful company where everything was great. Like how, how did you know you weren't swallowing the stupid pill? Yeah, and that is a that's a hard question. That's the risk that you have to take when. And I think there's two things that um, over the years that I've learned to get better at. Yeah. Number one is self trust. I've got to trust my gut, not necessarily my mind and my thoughts, because mm. those can sometimes, and even my emotions can sometimes steer me in the wrong way. <laughs> but trusting my gut and having a real check in with my body in terms of my decisions was, has been a really helpful thing because my body tells the truth. Um, it, it's not going to lie to me about how I'm experiencing this job or this particular calling that I'm in. And then the second thing is just this idea that, um, I am, I am responsible for my story and I am responsible to steward in the best way that I can. And I always remind myself, and whoever's listening right now needs to remind themselves of this one fact when they're maybe making a big decision or taking a risk. You are in a good story, okay? The story ends well. We're not in stories that are going to be disasters or um, horrible endings or it's all going to crash and burn. And I'm not saying that there won't be challenges or setbacks, But fundamentally, I remind myself that this is a good story. And so whatever I'm choosing is going to be good. It's going to be worthy. It's going to be, there's going to be so many great learnings that I'm going to get to experience over the years. And so that really letting abundance lead versus fear. So that leads me to another question. We're going to get into primal questions in a little bit, but like, if I remember correctly, isn't your primal question, am I safe? And you, you, you say things like you check your bank accounts every hour. I think there's probably some hyperbole to make sure that the money's still there and nobody took anything. There wasn't any fraud, <laughs> right? But I get that, that personality. It's like, you're not the roller coaster guy who might get thrown off the top. And yet you took what potentially could be a roller coaster leap out of a safe, secure, thriving organization where you were the founder to honestly, what all of us who have done an entrepreneurial leap know is really the unknown. Yes, we trust in God. Yes, we believe there's going to be good. Yes, we have some evidence. But like, how did you handle that if that is your personality and your wiring? Yeah, it, it really is my wiring to be risk averse and to, to play it safe and to be very predictive of making sure the results are what I want, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so um, when we make big moves like that and we, we take a leap, uh, there is that force that says, no, stay, uh, don't do it, um, stay in the comfort zone. But I, this is where I think for me, the thing that has helped me in these moments is not tapping into my primal question of my safety, mm. but really tapping into what I call my primal truth of I am safe. And that sort of um, delineation of reminding myself of, yes, there is a risk here, but I have the ability and the the knowledge and the 
the friendships and uh, the spouse where everybody is reminding me of my safety and that I'm going to be okay. And sometimes we just forget about that in these big moves is like, we think it's uh, just us or, you know, what that we've never done anything like this before. Like one of the things that I know about myself is that uh, I have the, the, a, a really powerful strength of problem solving. Okay. I just, I'm really good at solving problems. So it's like when I take a, a risk, like leaving a very successful design firm and kind of starting something brand new and, and unknown, I have to remind myself that I have the core strength of problem solving. So yeah, the problems will be different, but I can do this. And we sometimes forget about that. We forget who we are in our story, that we have what we need to continue to write a good story. So how did you go from design to people of the second chance? <laughs> well, um, again, I was kind of in this bivocational format and the went through a really big traumatic uh, failure, mm. uh, public failure with a, a book that I had written with my good friend, Judd Wilhite. And there, it had uh, sort of stirred up some controversy. And uh, Liz, I don't want to get into all the details, Carrie, but it was a mess. Okay. Okay. And this everybody is, knew this is jogging we my memory, but it's not top of mind. Yeah. yeah so ba basically, we put out a book on leadership, and uh, there was some some people that didn't like some of the theme, the creative themes that we use because it was a book using, it was a, it was called Deadly Viper Character Assassins. And <laughs> we, yeah. okay, just stop for a second. Yes. Mike Foster and Judd Wilhite are two of the finest, nicest human beings you're ever going to meet. Okay. So like, just, <laughs> I know, I know you both. So I'm really intrigued now. First of all, yeah. awesome title. And thank you. What exactly? Well, some did people did not think it was an awesome <laughs> title, Carrie. And, it was creative. Uh, it was yeah. very creative. It was, yeah. it was, uh, we wanted to be fun and, uh, we loved Bruce Lee and we grew up in the eighties. So like this whole idea of Kung Fu was a, a big part of our stories. And so we just use it as a creative metaphor to talk about some of the pitfalls of leadership and these assassins in our life. And so we, we kind of got in the crosshairs of an individual who didn't like, and this is early days of Twitter, uh, I think early days of cancel culture. And, um, you know, we we took a lot of heat, enough heat to where the book that we had published with the publisher was actually pulled from the shelves. And we we kind of went away with our, our tail between our legs. And, it, it, you know, again, I, I knew my heart and I knew Judd's heart was to really help people. That That's always been our, our uh, mission to, to, you know, do the work that we've been, we've been doing for a very long time. But this particular offering got, was misunderstood. And of course, I do a lot of things differently in terms of the content today. Uh, looking back, of course, um, but uh, yeah, so we were very, you know, very much like this public, uh, you know, embarrassment, public shaming, public, you know, just like, oh, we failed here. I remember taking, we had uh, 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 some boxes and books and marketing materials and all this stuff, uh, probably thousands, thousands of dollars worth of product. And I re remember just taking those boxes and just throwing them into the dumpster because it was just done. It was over the whole thing. And this was almost two years worth of work. And Oh, yeah. Um, so that fundamentally was the catalyst to people of the second chance because what Judd and I started doing was we just started blogging about failure and what that looks like and what do we do when things don't turn out the way we thought they would turn out and really used it as a springboard to talk about, I think something that's uh, significantly more important to me now is second chances versus perhaps uh character assassins. I think character assassins are important, but the idea of grace and second chances is probably a more important message that uh, we, we launched from that really public failure. 
Wow. But you know what's so interesting about public failure is I really don't have a memory of it. And I was active in leadership at the time. Like some little asterisk in the back of my brain is like, oh yeah, that probably happened. I remember that. But that's the thing. But it probably felt like your world was imploding, didn't it? Like just like oh like gosh. it was over. It, it really felt like everybody in America knew what we, that we were the guys with a band book. We were the guys who were, um, you know, doing all the wrong things in that moment, even though we were trying to do the right thing. And it really felt like, I remember going into rooms with other people and just thinking they all know. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I remember, you know, speaking at conferences on stages and thinking everybody in the audience sees me as the guy who, uh, who wrote the band book and not seeing the guy who, you know, is here to, to help them. And so it's like, it gets in your <sighs> head. It, it really, it re but, but here's the other thing. I think this is the beauty of these types of experiences is it, it helps me today because I work with a lot of leaders who are in crisis. Mm -hmm. I work with a lot of mm -hmm. leaders who are going through a firestorm and this isn't new territory for me. It's like, oh yeah, I've been there. I'd like to help you be a guide in this. And I can, I can remind them with great authority that they're going to be okay. You know, it's crazy. I was uh, spent Friday with a guy who has, I don't know, a million and a half, two million followers on social, uh, YouTube views, et cetera, pushing a billion with a B. And then I was hanging out with friends last night and they're like, what were you up to? And so I'm saying, oh, I hung out with, I don't want to say who it was, this guy and never heard of him. I went around, Have you guys ever heard of him? Nope, never heard of him. Uh, the guy's almost got a billion views. It's like, okay, that's fine, right? Like it's insane because you think I am the biggest thing or everybody is looking at me and the reality is they're not. As Seth Godin they're has not. said, right? If, if, if you have a number one New York Times bestselling book that sells... 10 million copies, 99.9% .9 of the planet has no idea who you are. This is insane, it, isn't it? Yeah. How did you... How but did it's, you, such, a, it's yeah. such a good thing to remind us, remind mm. ourselves of. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just that, no, not everybody's thinking about you right now. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and what makes me think that they might be, right, Mike? Like, <laughs> okay. So how do you... Because uh, lots of leaders have fallen into ditches over the last few years. COVID killed just about everybody in one form or another, you know, in terms of people leaving, people angry, people frustrated, people mad at you, people, ah, da, 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 da. what do you, what do you, how did you talk yourself out of that? How did that become, how did that not become as Henry Cloud has said here and elsewhere, personal, permanent, and pervasive. In other words, my life is over. Yeah. Well, there was certainly was a season where I I, I sort of felt that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my totally. life was over, and and it's probably um, healthy that you felt it, right? As opposed yeah. to ah, you know, totally. Yeah. yeah, we're not meant to sort of just rebound the next day, twenty four hours, and we're like a okay. There was a lot of therapy, Gary. There was a lot of mm -hmm. uh, talking through these these issues, um, but I do think the this is where. I've learned a lot about myself and we talked about like pushing through fear and I like safety. And, uh, you know, now I have, have these, have this really public failure. I just think this is where the driving force of your life and your mission comes into play. It's like, at some point I have to get back to the task that I was on and the task was trying to help people. And so the world, the, again, I don't think the world cares about my pain or my sadness or my embarrassment or, you know, how I felt hurt or anything. Like, I don't think they really care about that. And yet, if I sort of live in this sort of victim mindset and I can't now go back out there and do any good and it's just, who's served by that? I don't, certainly not me and certainly not the people that I want to help. And so I think there is this, this, force inside of me. It's like, we got to keep going, please. We got to keep going. And hence the message of grace and so on. How did you move into the seven primal questions? Because I found, I found your framework really helpful and we'll talk about it, but it helped me solve a problem I didn't know how to solve. Yeah. So uh, when COVID hit, my, my work changed pretty dramatically because 
about 50 to 60% of my life was speaking and workshops and travel and all that sort of stuff that a lot of us were accustomed to. And for whatever reason, we, uh, we, uh, my, my whole life just changed in like overnight. I remember the shutdown, like, Oh, I'm going to have to pivot here. Yep. And so what I pivoted to was, uh, ramping up my executive coaching with leaders. And I, I call it kind of executive coaching slash counseling because with the work that I do with leaders is a combination of therapy and coaching. But what, uh, oh, you know, so I was doing 30 clients a week, 30 sessions with leaders in all different contexts, Navy SEALs, pastors, Chick-fil-A uh, owners, um, I worked with uh, HGTV um, hosts. I mean, just everybody you can think of. Hmm. And one of the things that I love to do, and I, I think God's given me this sort of natural curiosity about what makes people tick and why they are who they are. And I'm just passionately curious about people. And I've taken really good notes. And so I started being in these meetings and really... Uh, the work was about what is the core thing that is driving this human being that's on the other side of this Zoom call? What is the thing that, um, you know, is driving their choices and behaviors and their triggers and their gifts and their passions? And so I began sort of this exploration, four years of research on trauma, attachment theory, what makes people great, or 6,000 hours of one-on-one -on -one interviews with people, 22 group labs to create this model called the primal question. And fundamentally, what, what the in a, a very kind of quick nutshell, what the primal question is, it's a question that gets imprinted on us in our early childhood that we then subconsciously carry into our adult lives that we keep asking over and over again in our relationships, at work, to society at large. And when uh, it's when that primal question is answered with a yes, we are our best selves. We're thriving, we're flourishing, we feel good inside. Okay, everything's like working. But when we get a no or a maybe to that primal question, we go into what I call the scramble. And the scramble is all the unhealthy things we do as individuals to try to force the answer to our primal question back to a yes. People pleasing, uh, performance addiction, workaholicism, uh, codependency, uh, all control, hypervigilance, all of these unhealthy things that we do to try to get our primal question back to a yes. And so the whole book and sort of the model is about understanding that question and how that question drives your life and what to do about it. So this is interesting. I took your assessment, which I think is free, by the way. It's free, right? It the, is. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Like I know my Enneagram number. I know my working genius. I know all, you know, I've done so many assessments over my life. Yes. It's insane. And I thought, okay, what's the value of this assessment? How is yours different from all the other assessments that are out there, free or paid? Yeah, so it is a free assessment. You can take it at primalquestion.com. It takes about five minutes. There's, you know, 20, yeah. 25 questions. And then at the end of the the assessment, I, I come online and I, I give you this little summary of uh, some things to think about in terms of your particular question. But I think what makes it different is I'm a, I'm a passionate believer in simplicity, and one of the things that I love about the primal question is it's very simple. I can, I can talk to you for about 10 minutes about the concept, give you the seven questions, and basically you could go use it immediately in your life and you could probably teach it to your, your spouse or your friends or your team. It's that simple and yet it has a lot of powerful uh, weight behind it in terms of kind of getting to the thing uh, that's most important. You know, a lot of times I think in, in our lives, we're dealing with the branches of the tree instead of the roots of the tree. And we spend a lot of time in therapy or coaching, trimming branches and trying to say, well, if I clip this branch and clip that branch, then the problem's solved. 
But the primal question is saying, is getting to the core roots of who we are as individuals, as leaders, as spouses, as parents, and understanding that hidden programming. And instead of it uh, being hidden, it's we're bringing it, uh, you know, front and center to where you can take control of it and understand it, which makes you a very powerful person when you can do that. Mm. Yeah. What's at stake if you don't understand your primal question? Well, it's sort of like, think of the primal question as a, an operating system. If, if you have an operating system or a default that you go to in meetings, like, hey, you, you're always the one talking because you feel insecure in meetings. Well, that's going to create a problem for your leadership, right? Or if you are a pastor and you don't understand that your primal question is connected to your value or the, the need to feel wanted or included, if and you're giving a message on Sunday morning and in the feedbacks may be uh, mediocre to it, and then all of a sudden you're feeling all this rejection and you're 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 doubting your calling and you're doubting whether you should even be a pastor. If we're not uh, clear on what the programming is, we can make really poor choices for our lives and actually add a lot of unnecessary suffering. And so, to me, there's nothing wrong with having a primal question. What's wrong is not understanding that you have one and what it's trying to tell you. Mm -hmm. So I did the assessment and uh, we'll get to the other primal questions and I'd love to understand the framework around them. But honestly, looking at it, I didn't know where I was going to land because I kind of looked at it and I thought, okay, those are seven questions. Yeah, I feel fairly safe, secure, loved, wanted, moderately successful, decent enough? You know, that's an interesting theological question. And I think uh-huh. I have a purpose, you know, uh, but I was, I was telling you before we hit record uh, at our church, my pastor's walking us through a series, which I found really good, loosely based around John Mark Comer's Live No Lies, which we've talked about on this podcast before. And I thought, you know, I've done so much therapy. Like, I wonder what any current lie is that I'm sort of believing. Totally open to the fact that, yeah, I probably believe things that aren't true about me or the world that that God wants to address. But like, I didn't have a smoking gun out there. Then I took your assessment and it nailed me. So I'm primal question number seven. Do I have a purpose? I guess is how you frame the question. Yes. Um, unpack that for me. What, what, how does that drive me? Do I have a purpose? Yeah. Well, with that particular question, and it's actually uh, the research shows that it it's a question that a lot of people have. You know, if there was a bell curve around the questions, you know, question seven, do I have a purpose is a pretty common question. And the way to look at that, that question, as in all the seven questions, is that Carrie has, Carrie's uh, apex emotional need is to have purpose in his life. And when that need is met, Carrie is his best version of himself. He's thriving, he feels good, his relationships are working, the his company's working, everything is just jiving along. So when that emotional need is basically when your primal question is answered with a yes, you're you're fantastic. But when Carrie's primal question of do I have a purpose is answered with a no or a maybe. (laughs) Yeah, you don't want to be around, Mike. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, because this is, maybe we'll do a little therapy session. Sure, sure. What happens when your emotional need for purpose is being, is not being met? What do you do? What does your scramble look like? The thing that you do to try to force the answer back to a yes. So I don't know that it's a scramble, but I can tell you what happened to me. I told the story. I haven't thought about it in years, but we're talking about, and listen, there are a lot of great government employees. There's a lot of great, you know, government departments, et cetera. But I worked for the civil service in Canada one summer I was 23 Mm -hmm. and I was in the file room. It was like big time, man, big time. The file room at the National Health Ministry. So I go to work and, you know, I'm pretty driven, like pretty like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So I had to reorganize the file room. And about a month into it, my boss pulled me aside. My boss's boss pulled me aside and he said, Carrie, I need to talk to you. I'm like, why? What's going on? He goes, 
um, you're working way too hard. You're way too efficient. He said, you're going to be out of a contract by July. This needs to last until Labor Day. You're just going too fast. And you're making everybody else in this department look bad by how hard you work. You need mm-hmm. to back off. And I'm like, oh, man. And I'll tell you, that is like the, all my motivation disappeared overnight. I became this driftless, aimless, don't care whether I go to work, don't care if I'm up till 2 a.m. with buddies on a work night. Like I was not proud of how I behaved that summer, but it's like you just pulled the universe out from under my feet. And then of course, September comes, I'm back in school, on my way to law school. I think that was between undergrad and law school. So, you know, I kind of had a purpose and everything. But like, yeah, if, if it's not clear, I become this lethargic mess. And it is not, I am not a nice human to be around. Yes. Okay. That's, that's fantastic. So here, here's uh, one of the things that the research shows is that the kryptonite for your question, do I have purpose? The, the thing that will just knock you out is doing something that is meaningless or not impactful or feeling that you are bringing the fullness of yourself to the world. Okay. And so what, what the other thing that I, I heard in perhaps in your scramble, because one of the things that we do is that we take control of our own question and we try to answer it with a yes. So I would, I would think workaholicism, maybe an over uh, a sense for being overdriven on something, is you trying to get a yes to your primal question of purpose. Oh, so you tend I'm to maybe workaholic. go all in, yeah. mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So again, that would be a thing that you would want to be aware of. Like, why am I working so hard? Why am I so overdriven on this task? Why? Why am I pushing so hard? Well, that's your primal question of purpose um, driving all of that. Because the idea of you not having, and again, I love the kind of the example because it seems like that's a small thing. Like that's not, nothing wrong with the civil service, but uh, you know. I I was at the bottom of whatever, whatever, you know, org chart there was underneath the basement, there was me. And I think that led to the resignation because I kind of realized, okay, with the federal civil service, there's nothing I can do here. I'm not going to be able to to move a bureaucracy. I'm not going to be able to convince my boss. And it's not my career. I've got a couple of months to put in. So I did. I killed time but it just about killed me. And then I would yeah. say, you know, if there are other places where I've been involved, like at a law firm, when I went to, the, to work in law for that year, you know, I wasn't happy with the salary because my friends were being paid more. So I negotiated like a raise for the articling students there and like really got one pa- partner mad. I'm like, all right, I don't care. You know, I'm not going to do this with my life. I'm going into seminary after this. But like, I always <laughs> take the bull by the horn so that we get on track, on mission, ready to go. And sometimes that's worked out healthily. Sometimes that's been marvelously unhealthy too. I'll be the mm. first to admit. Yeah. And what I would say to you is uh, own that part of you, own that emotional need for purpose. The other thing that I love, and I talk about this in the book, is with every primal question comes a primal gift. And I see this playing out in your life in spades. So what we do is we take our primal question and we put it over everybody else and we assume that they're asking the exact same question that we're asking. And then we work really hard to make sure to answer that with a yes. So Carrie, your whole life, and again, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I haven't known you very long. I've known you a few years, but everything you do is about helping others with their own purpose, having greater impact, having greater significance in the work that they're doing. That is uniquely part of who you are, but what, you know, my, my thesis is that's directly tied to your primal question. So with every primal question comes this primal gift. And as leaders, we need to understand again, the question so that we can maximize the gift part. Another thing I'm having, you know, cause I'm in my late fifties now, but another conversation I'm having with friends is like, some of them are starting to think about retirement. One or two have retired. I just, I, I just can't find that exciting. I have enough time to like sit on the beach and 
have a little vacation and I do that for a few weeks or a month, a year at the most. And then I'm like, all right, let's get back at it. Is that because of my wiring? Is that because of my primal question? Um, what is that? Or is it my deeply dysfunctional? Help me understand that. <laughs> no, it, it is absolutely tied to your primal question because again, this is an emotional need that you have in your life. It's your highest emotional need. It's been with you forever. Yeah. Okay. For sure. It's, you know, let's call it wiring. Let's call it emotional needs. Let's call it primal question. But this is a unique part of who you are. And so the unique parts of this particular question are you have to do things that are impactful and meaningful. They have to make a difference. That's how you see the world. That's how you see yourself. It's how you see others. And so the idea of retirement and doing something that's not meaningful or impactful just doesn't sit well with you. Now, other questions, it might, you know, like I can see myself retiring, okay, oh, yeah. because I have a different question. I'm not, I'm not an anti-retirement person. What is, before we move on to the other questions, and I want to dive into yours, what, what's some of my pathology? Like what if, because if, you say it's a pretty common question. So what do I have to be careful of? I've heard, don't assume everybody is asking what's my purpose because they may have a different primal question, right? If all you have is a hammer, yes. everything looks like a nail. So that's good. I know that I can sometimes be a little toxic if I get off mission or I don't know what my... Uh, you know, my, my, my question is, or my purpose is what, what are some other pathologies associated with my gift and yeah. question? Well, here's, here's one, here's one that came up a lot is that they tend to be, uh, Q7s tend to be dreamers and visionaries. Okay. And sometimes they will get caught so much in the dreaming and vision that they neglect the process or the execution. Guilty. Okay. Guilty. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, all right. so my, that's my just, team again, should stop listening at this point. If you're listening, all right, just let's move on to the next point. No, keep going. Keep going. Absolutely. Well, yeah. And, and again, it's, it's nothing to judge ourselves over. It's something to be aware of. Right. And so we can be more effective in these areas. And so like, you will probably, a lot of Q7s get frustrated with process, get frustrated with anything that slows the vision down. Like, you know, those are real challenges. And so as a way to um, understand ourselves better and to be a better teammate on our team, we have to be aware of those tendencies. And so we got to look at people who want to do process or slow things down as not adversaries to our vision, but but an important part of executing a vision. And so that's just a, a thing that you yeah. will always need to manage and you want to be aware of that. I've, I've, I've learned that. I've had to learn that and I've learned that. And I, th I guess that's true, right? Like if you understand this, you know what the rough edges are. You can sand some of those down a little bit and it's smoother for the rest of the team. All right, exactly. let's talk about your primal question. Your question one, Q1. Right. Yeah. So I'm question one, uh, which is, am I safe? And again, the whole model is built on early childhood imprints. And I do want to, at some point, ask you about where you think that. Okay. Well, let's do, let's do that because I thought I don't yeah. know the early um, imprint. So there's something that happened in my childhood that made me think that purpose is everything. Um, let, let me ask you a question. <laughs> and I, I don't know this about your story. Yeah. But did you grow up in a Christian home? Yep. Did. Yeah. Immigrant okay. Christian home. So both okay. of my parents were born in the Netherlands and I was born in Canada. Okay. Again, the research. And this is like, I asked you that question because this is what, you know, the 6,000 hours presented was that typically people with question seven, do I have a purpose, have grown up in a Christian home. And here's why. Because probably the, the water that you swam in as a kid was around doing something great for God, that God had a plan for your life, that he had a purpose for your life. This is what, you know, there was sort of this, and as kids, we don't necessarily understand everything that that, that means. And so what happens is it gets a little confusing. So as you're going along in your life, let's say you're, you, not you specifically, but say you're a middle manager at IBM or something. Okay. And you are confused about 
purpose and what does purpose look like and what does real impact mean? And you've been sort of taught that it means changing the world and saving Africa and building wells and being a pastor. And all of a sudden you're this middle manager at IBM. It That creates a lot of uh, frustration, a lot of confusion for that person. But typically it's because it wasn't fully explained to you about what purpose actually means. Um, I remember I was working with a, a friend of mine, I write about this in the book, Jason Russell, who started a, uh, an organization called Invisible Children. And they had this phenomenal success around this uh, on, uh, online campaign called Coney 2012. Mm-hmm. They're trying to, to help liberate uh, these children from the Remember that. kind of the, the control of of uh, Joseph Coney, and uh, you know, at the height of their success and Jason's success, you know, Angelina Jolie was tweeting about them. They were on the Oprah Winfrey show. Everything was going great, like incredible impact, millions of dollars, hel- helping save the world. And then it all crashes and burns for Jason because. A few days later, he has a psychotic break and is running on the streets of San Diego naked. Gets posted on TMZ. His world comes crashing down, all right? He's, he's in a sense, leaves the organization, uh, is, you know, talk about public failure and embarrassment. This is, this was Jason's story. And I... You walked with Jason through some of that, and then he he came back about ten years later, and we were I was working with him again, and he was talking about uh, how his life no longer had purpose. And Jason's primal question is, "Do I have a purpose?" No, no big surprise, right? That's of course his primal question is about purpose because that's what he's been doing his entire life is trying to save the world, and so now he's doing things that are much smaller. Uh, still significant, but much smaller. And, but he was wrestling with this whole idea of like, I got to do more. It's got to be bigger. It's got to have greater platform. I got to get back to where George Clooney and Angelina Jolie know my name, right? And so all of this stuff was just creating incredible suffering for him. I remember just saying, hey, Jason, you have a purpose. You have mm. always had a purpose. It doesn't matter whether you're doing Invisible Children, Coney 2012, running a design firm today, a purpose with your kids. And so it's this confusion around the question that creates a lot of unnecessary suffering for our lives. And so what happens, again, we understand our lives through the lens of being kids. And there's some confusion. That's why you have the question. And so the fact that you grew up in a Christian home, talking about impact, talking about living a significant life, you know, doing great things for God, and you now having this primal question is no surprise to me mm-hmm. whatsoever. And hardworking immigrant parents too, seeing that and grandparents. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's a really good distinction too, because I've seen people like me and myself, probably in my younger years, get caught up in grandiosity, right? Well, mm-hmm. well, the biggest podcast in the world. First of all, that's extremely difficult to do. Secondly, you know, I, I, the way I look at it now, things have gone much better and bigger than I ever thought they would. But as I'm focused on the next 25 years, I'm thinking ahead to just make a contribution make a meaningful contribution. Mm. Let God determine size, but you just make a contribution. You get up, try to make a difference, help some people every day. And to me, that's immensely satisfying. It really is. Yes. Yeah. I feel better. Whether that's a neighbor that nobody ever hears about or whether that's, you know, a big podcast guest or whatever. It's just, that, that, is that a more helpful framing of the purpose question? Yeah, well, basically what you're doing, again, a part of the book is I talk about living in our primal truth and not our primal question. And basically what you're communicating there, Carrie, is that you're no longer allowing the question to drive your life. Do I have a purpose where I have to go be successful, biggest podcast, go you know, do all these big things, uh, grand things? You're living in what I call the primal truth, where you take your question and you turn it into a statement. So it goes from, do I have a purpose 
to I have purpose. You're already overflowing with purpose. So that allows you to do small things, medium-sized things, and big things, knowing that all of it has purpose. See, now as a kid, you may have thought that having purpose meant doing big things. Mm -hmm. But now, and, and asking the question, have I arrived? Have I Am I living an impactful enough life? That's the question at play. Now you live in your primal truth. I have purpose. And that is just a... Um, just a great place to land in terms of our emotional health and our enjoyment of life. Oh, that's good to know. Okay, super helpful framing. Let's talk about your question. Q1, am I safe? Yes, yeah, so uh, this question is about the need for emotional and physical safety. Um, people who have this question, like myself, look at perhaps the world as a dangerous place. And the reason I, the early childhood imprint for me was um, childhood trauma. So uh, when I was uh, uh, young, I was sexually abused by a family friend. Sorry. And one of the things that happened with that experience was I did not feel safe whatsoever. And the other part of this is um, when I told my parents what was going on, we never really talked about it again. And so as a little kid, and that's not to blame my parents, that's not a critique of my parents, it's just a kind of understanding how these imprints happen in our lives. And so as a little boy, I felt like I had to take respons full responsibility for my safety and because I didn't feel safe. And so now I'm a grown man, I carry this question into my adult life, and I'm always thinking about safety. See, where your highest emotional need is purpose, my highest emotional need is safety. And when I experience safety and feeling safe, I'm thriving, I'm flourishing, I'm feeling good. But anytime I don't feel safe, I, I go into my scramble. And my scramble, Carrie, looks like hypervigilance, hypercontrol, trying to predict everything that, that might happen in a negative way and trying to avoid that. Um, sometimes it, it look, you mentioned checking my bank accounts. Yes, I check everything. I, I'm looking at every single detail. So that's my scramble. And I got to be aware of those triggers and those tendencies in my life of what happens when I don't feel safe. But here's the primal gift part. And this is what I really want to highlight in all of this is that the primal question is not a problem to solve. It's something to understand and then maximize. So my primal gift is, again, me take my, I take my question and I put it over Carrie and I put it over every uh, client that I have and I put it over every audience that I speak to. And I think they're all asking, am I safe? And so I do a really good job at helping people feel safe, which is why everybody tells me their deepest, darkest secrets after knowing me for five minutes, mm. okay? It's a relational superpower that I have of safety. Why? Because I've been studying it. I have a PhD in safety because it's the very thing that I've been paying attention to my entire life, right. just like you and purpose. Hmm. Okay, super helpful. Anything else on safety? Uh, I mean, I know yeah, there's a I mean, doctoral class on it, but yeah, for the yeah, purpose. just I think one of the things I'd say on all of this is is it's very easy to judge our emotional needs. So I'm a I'm a man, okay, in America, and the fact that I would say publicly that I need to feel safe feels like weakness. Mm -hmm. It feels like that's not very manly, Mike. Right, but. I have to just recognize the fact that this is a part of who I am because of my story and my experiences. And I need to be aware of that and not try to pretend that that emotional need doesn't exist. Just like you can't pretend that your emotional need for purpose doesn't exist. And I don't know what my wife Tony's primal question is, but safety and security have been big issues, I would say, in her life. And I think she would be the first to say it. And it's easy for me then to come in and go, yeah, everything's cool. What are you, what are you doing that for? Like, it's fine. Everything's fine. But that's not motivating me, right? So I can be yes. very insensitive if, if I miss that. 
Well, you bring up a really good point because the the way that the primal question plays out in in our marriages is significant. I, I I tell people that the reason why relationships fail is not because of you know stress or parenting problems or you know sex or any of the you know not going off dates. Okay, the reason why relationships fail is because that your spouse continually answers your primal question with a no or a maybe. Okay. And we fundamentally can't stay in relationships where that's happening. By the way, you bring up an a interesting point. The far, the, and I'm, I'm just going to give you some, some marriage advice here, Carrie. Right. If you're a seven and your bride is a one, the research shows that the farther the number, uh, uh, the farther away the questions are from each other, the harder it's going to be because she doesn't understand your emotional need for purpose. That's a foreign idea for you to go change the world. And you probably don't understand her core need for safety because that's, that's a foreign idea to you. And so that, you know, by the way, John Tyson, uh, who's up in New York, yeah, pastor in New York, his, you know, his, he's a Q7, do I have purpose? And his wife's a Q1, am I safe? And he said, he told me, I was with him a few months ago. He says, that's the number one thing that we have to manage in our relationship. Wow. Because she wants me to stay home and I want to go change the world. Ah, there you go. Okay. I don't know. I'm going to be anxious for Tony to take this because it could be, it could be something else. I really don't know. It could be any of them, but that's my guess. I could be wrong. Okay. I don't want to belabor the other questions, but I want to run through them so that uh, yep. leaders have an opportunity to spot themselves. So we've covered, do I have a purpose? We've covered, am I safe? The next one is, am I secure? That's Q2. Yeah, this and this is all around financial security, the need for financial security and connection to feel protected, okay? And these folks are, are really... Uh, hypervigilant on the numbers and having enough and checking bank accounts and making sure that um, they they have enough resource to do their lives. And when they don't, they they go into their scramble. And this one's a really like, and the thing I say about this particular question, um, math is no match for emotions. And I say that because I have a client who's probably worth close to $500 million, whose Whoa. primal question is, am I secure? And I'm going to say probably, thing, I don't know, Mike, but probably. <laughs> yeah. But he, the work that we do together is he's not sure he has enough money. Wow. And, and that's how powerful these, these primal questions are in our life. Of course he has enough money. Of course he has enough resource. But if he doesn't feel it, and if he doesn't understand the programming that's driving sort of his anxiety around money, then he's really living life at a disadvantage. And so this is what we do is we like, okay, why is that need there? Well, he grew up in a home where the, the bill collectors were always calling and knocking on the door. He had that imprint of not having enough. Wow. Okay. And that's largely financial, the security. Largely financial. Okay. Yes. Uh, Q3, am I loved? That's a biggie. This is the, this is the question that deals with uh, the emotional need to be known, heard, and seen. Uh, these folks just, um, you know, and their kryptonite would be indifference. Just feeling like, yeah, I take you or leave you, that sends them into their scramble. But these are also the people with the primal gift. They are empathy experts. They are relational experts. If you have a church, you want these people on your front doors because they're so relationally strong. Again, putting their primal question over everybody else, am I loved? So everybody that walks through that, that door of that church, they're going to make sure that person feels loved. Mm -hmm. And so... Again, understanding for our teams, how we use the questions. Okay, do I have people in the right places? Um, are we are, are the gifts aligned according to their primal question? And so uh, they're wonderful people. They're just super, they're relationship superstars. And, uh, but they're also prone to needing to feel loved and known. And also uh, their scramble looks like codependency and people pleasing and, you know, not saying what they really mean to, to, in order to maintain relationship. Okay. 
Good. Uh, am I wanted? Am I wanted? This is Bob Goff's uh, primal question. And am I wanted is really the need to be to belong and to be included. Now, who would guess? Right? Who would guess? Yeah. Again, the thing with Bob that I love is his primal gift is so obvious, right? He he's an inclusion master. Everybody is his best friend. Everybody, you know, come over to my house, you know, come hang with me. It's like everybody's invited. He's the only guy that I know who has put his cell phone number in the back of his book, right? And that's a and real says, thing. Call me. Yeah. That he is a real it. thing. But only a Q4 and my wanted would do that because every time somebody calls that number, Bob gets a yes to his primal question. Hmm. hmm. Wow. Okay, Q5. Q5, am I successful? These are people who tend to grow up in competitive homes where winning and scoreboards were in the water of your family of origin. You know, it could be sibling rival rivalry, it could just be hey, the parent that were perhaps you struck out twice uh in the little league game and then dad is kind of down on you and is maybe silent uh, on the ride home. Mm. Okay. This is where um, success is, and really success slash winning is really important to you. And so the understanding that emotional needs are really important because uh, people with this question tend to be workaholics. They tend to, to win at whatever it takes. You know, winners win is their motto. And that can lead to a lot of um, a lot of problems in their lives, but they're also their primal gift, the ability to to make things around them successful. They have the ability. They make great coaches. They make great um, leaders because they can see uh, the the matrix of winning. Gotcha. And then Q six. Am I good enough? Uh, this is really uh, individuals who grew up in homes where uh, they were judged, criticized often. They never felt like they measured up. And so they carry this primal question into their adult lives and keep asking, am I good enough? And this question gets expressed in two unique ways. One, massive insecurity. Okay, they're, they're the wallflowers. They don't say anything in the team meeting because they don't feel like whatever they have to contribute is that valuable. So there's kind of massive insecurity. Uh, you know, a lot of times in with teams, maybe if you're working with a Q6, uh, they don't do well with feedback or criticism. And so they'll get very defensive and the walls go up because when you give feedback or criticism, it's an it, it's basically a no to their primal question. Okay, um, so one way it expresses itself in insecurity. The other way is through narcissism. Mm. So Donald Trump is a Q six. Okay, and the reason why he, he's a Q, if you look at his story, it's just so so obvious. He grew up with a father that was incredibly critical. He never felt like he can measure up to his dad's standards. And so it gets expressed in basically this puffery and narcissism to say, I'm the best person ever. Okay. Right. And so, you know, um, understanding those things and understanding why people are the way they are and understanding their primal question then allows us to perhaps have more compassion and more clarity on why people do what they do. Wow. Well, that is, you know, because you go through that, and I think every one of us has asked every one of those questions at one point or another yes. in our life, right? Absolutely. Am I good enough? Am I successful? Am I wanted? But I guess they just, there's one that just keeps recurring over and over again. So you've talked about the workplace. I mean, I understand how understanding your Enneagram can really help at work, how understanding your working genius, understanding your Myers-Briggs, uh, right path, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many profiles. How does this help you figure out, you know, let's talk about marriage or relationships, and then let's talk about work. How do you use this to put things together in those contexts? Yeah, so let's start with marriage. Um, I want to know my spouse's primal question. I really do. Because if I can know my spouse's primal question, all I have to do is be uh, consistent with one or two things that answer their primal question with a yes. 
Okay. So like with my wife, her primal question is, am I loved? Okay. This is the need to feel seen, known, and heard. So the way that I answer her primal question with a yes is by listening. Okay. Which isn't necessarily, um, I'm a problem solver. I bring solutions. I give feedback. I'm an advisor, right? I talk. Okay. I'm action oriented. And so I was really messing up when I, cause when I do that, I'm not listening and I'm basically answering her primal question of, am I loved with a no? Okay. Mm. And so I want to know what not to do to, you know, I want to know the things that are feeling like no's to you, Jennifer, but then I also want to know what I need to do to, to answer your primal question with a yes. So as you think about this and I do couples counseling all the time and I just say, Hey, listen, guys, just give me like, I'd ask the spouse, Give me two ways that he can answer your primal question with a yes. And typically she would go, I don't know, I'm not sure. Or she'd give some, like, no, listen, we got to have a very specific way to give you a yes. So you need to define that for him. You need to tell him clearly what it is. And then buddy, you need to start doing that as often as you Read can. Read the script, if you follow have the a script. Successful yeah. Relationship. Yes, yeah. follow the script. And it really makes it kind of fun and easy because I know every fight that my wife and I have, every conflict that we have, every time we're feeling disconnected, really what's going on is that we're we're answering each each other's primal question with a no, okay? And I got to figure out how to answer it with a yes. So that it's a very powerful tool and simple tool in relationships with teams. Here's what here's what I found is that a person will not follow you and go all in with your vision as a leader if you are answering their primal question with a no or a maybe, okay? They, you know, if I don't feel safe in your organization, I don't feel like you have my back. I don't feel like, I feel like I could get fired at any moment. It's going to be hard to go all in with you, okay? Um you know, if, if say you're working for someone, Carrie, if you're not feeling that your work is feeling impactful or significant, I'm gone. You can't work at that. You're gone. I'm gone. Yeah. And so as leaders, we want to understand what our team members primal question is. So we can make sure that we're uh, finding all the unique ways to say yes to it. I would say like Q4s, am I wanted? You never want to walk past a Q4's desk and not invite them to something that's going on later in the evening. Mm. You know, like say they're the, the team's getting together for appetizers at uh, Buffalo Wild Wings, all right? And you don't invite the Q4, you've lost them, yeah. okay? Wow. Now you, can, uh, you cannot invite me to the Buffalo Wings, I'm I'm completely fine with yeah, that. Yeah, followed your social. It's like it's amazing. It's like it's okay. I'm 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 all right on my own. Leave me alone. I'm yeah. all right on my own. I actually like it yeah. that way. Yeah. But so when we can orient around our team's needs, but also how are we best using their primal gift? Okay. So if I have a that same guy where I want to make sure I invite him to to Buffalo Wild Wings, he's also have this has this powerful gift to include others, create belongings. So he has this power to convene. So if I'm starting something, I want this guy at the point. If I'm going if I need to go from 0 to 50, like say some some program, I want him in charge of it because he is relationally connected. He knows how to get people together and make them feel wanted and included. So again, it's a way for us to put people in the right places based on the needs of the organization. Okay, so one more question. If we can just go through the types again, and you can give us, and I understand, like with your, you're saying with a couple, you have to be hyper-specific. It's not like, just listen. Okay, no, listen to me by locking your eyes in and giving me at least seven minutes of your undivided attention. You're looking for something more specific like that. So we're dealing in generalities. There's a lot more in the book, a lot more in the assessment, but let's go through the questions and just give us like one or two lines on each about what we need to do. And let's think about a workplace uh, setting because we're leaders, uh, what we can do. So someone who's Q1, am I safe? Okay, what I want to do with them is give them as much detail as possible. Ah. Because in confusion or lack of clarity, I don't feel safe. So here's my example. Don't call me on Wednesday 
and say, I got a, I got an emergency meeting on Friday that I need you to be at, you know, and leave a voicemail without the, the necessary details. Well, I have an emergency meeting on Friday because I forgot to plan Sarah's birthday party that later that afternoon and I need your help. That's good communication with a Q1. Am I safe versus lacking clarity? And my mind is going to go to worst case scenarios all day long. And for the seven visionaries, yeah, detail, detail is your nemesis. So you're going to have to really step out of it and say, and this is specifically what I want, when I want it, how I want it. Okay, great. This is super. Q2, am I secure? Q2, you want to make sure that um, if they're working for you, you want to be very clear on their compensation, uh, their performance, that they're not going to get fired and be put in a, a, a place where they're not going to be able to pay their bills. So you want to have the money conversations with Q2s. Okay. Am I loved Q3? This is where you want to be a really good listener because this person's highest emotional need is being seen and heard and known. You want to talk to them more about just the work stuff. You want to talk to them about their life, their dreams, things that they're thinking about. Be a little bit deeper and slower with a Q3. All right. We kind of touched on this, but just a quick recap. Q4, am I wanted? Yeah, you just want to make sure they're they're invited, okay? That you want them there. That you, you, you walk by their desk and just say, hey, uh, Carrie, I'm just so glad you're a part of this team. Uh, I'm really glad that you're here. Okay. If, if that was your question. Q5, am I successful? Uh, yeah, for, the, for, for this uh, question, you know, failure is their kryptonite. Okay. Feeling like a failure, feeling like they didn't win. And so with this particular person, you want to just be very clear with them about what success looks like. Um, what healthy success looks like, not perhaps worldly success, and really define um, winning for them. You know, what what are the goals? What are uh, the things that we're going after? You don't want to sort of um, leave leave that nebulous with a, with a Q5. Q6, am I good enough? <laughs> okay, so this is, this is a really hard one as a leader uh, because... A Q6 is going to be very, very sensitive to feedback. And feedback is a part of any organization and any, you know, the role of a leader is to give feedback to this person. And so what I would encourage a leader to do with a Q6 is make sure that you affirm and say yes to their primal question first before bringing any type of feedback or criticism. They got to know that you value them, that they are worthy, that they are good enough before you start bringing in uh, any type of criticism. And then for those of us who are Q7s, do I have well, a purpose? Well, Q7s, I want... I want them in the meetings where we're dreaming about what could be. I want them sharing, um, you know, their vision and talking about, you know, where we are now, but is important. But the, the Q7s are going to help you see, you know, a year or five years, 10 years from now. And I want to really cultivate that and not be a no person around that. Like, we can't do that. That's not going to happen. I don't want to be a wet Cost blanket too much. with a Q7. <laughs> Cost too much. You know, th- we, I got to be make, making sure that I'm, I'm uh, stoking those fires of purpose for you. Wow. Like, this has been so helpful. Helpful for me. I know for everybody listening as well. The book is called Seven Primal Questions. And uh, where can people, it's available everywhere books are sold. Where can people find you these days, Mike? Yeah, so you can find me on on Instagram first, uh, Mike Foster two thousand, and I talk a lot about you know the the primal question how it plays out in our marriages and our teams and our personal lives, and then primalquestion dot com is where I'd encourage you to go to take the assessment, uh, find out which question you're you are, and uh, there's a bunch of resources, free resources, videos about how it impacts teams, how it impacts marriages, how it impacts you and your own personal development. Um, by the way, Carrie, one other thing I'd say mm. is if there's communicators out there, preachers out there, typically what we do is we preach to our own primal question. <laughs> oh, yes, And we, we forget do. about the other six. Yes, we do. Oh, that's good. Busted. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. So things like that, where if you, if the more aware you become of this question within you, you really have this incredible opportunity to, to level up. And so primalquestion.com, do the assessment, uh, and then find a bunch of good resources there. Mike, you can't thank you enough. Really appreciated our time together today. Thank you. Thanks, Gary.